<laughs> it's always so nice to come outside of this side here. Hello, warm welcome. <laughs> very nice to have you here. Thank you very much for coming and joining us once again for uh, the next session within the framework of Berlinale Talents. Uh, Monday is a day where lots of things are happening here at Talents, uh, but one thing we dedicate the day to is cinematography. So we're doing it together with our partner, Canon, and we have lots of things from the early morning to the afternoon to, uh, with uh, more encounters, more discussions about visual storytelling, about how to do cinematography and what does it have to do with space. Uh, for the next session and before we introduce you to the man you're waiting for, please give a warm welcome to the moderator of the session, Peter Cowie. Well, good afternoon again. Uh, over the years, there's been a tradition of having great cinematographers as guests of the Berlin Other Talents. Um, we had Janusz Kaminski, for example, who shot Saving Private Ryan for, for Spielberg. Um, uh, we've had Christian Berger, who did The White Ribbon, for Michael Haneke, we had Andrew Lesney just after he'd shot Lord of the Rings. But today's guest, Peter Zeitlinger, is remarkably versatile in that he's equally at home with documentaries and fictional feature films. He, for the last 20 years, he's been really known around the world for his extraordinary collaboration with Werner Herzog. But he's also worked with that other great Austrian director, Ulrich Seidel, and uh, he has just done Queen of the Desert, which is in the running for the Golden Bear. So please welcome Peter Zeitlinger. Good evening. Uh, Peter, we have uh, uh, some clips from your work, which we're very excited about. We even have some images from your 3D work uh, with Werner. Uh, but I wanted to start by quoting uh, Sven Nikvist, who I believe was one of your lecturers at the University in Vienna, and he said that um, he and Ingmar Bergman worked so long together that by the end of it they exchanged very few words when they were planning a scene. They had a symbiotic relationship. They almost communicated without words. Has that been the same with you and Werner Herzog? Absolutely. Um, Werner Herzog never wants to talk about the film while he is doing it. He talks afterwards and before the film is being done, but mostly with journalists or with extras, um, but not with me. So he's always expecting me to understand what is in his mind and what is in his script and what is how to transform it to, into something which you can see on the screen. And sometimes, and, and sometimes I learn what is the thought behind it when I visit a press conference and I <laughs> hear him talking to the, to the audience and to the journalists. So then I afterwards understand if I understood it right or not. <laughs> Does he phone you way in advance and say, look, I've got a new script or I've got a new idea? Does he send you the script in advance? What's the first stage of your collaboration? Um, mostly, before he writes a script, he's already telling uh, details uh, out of the story or details out of some characters or whatever is the idea what, which he has behind, behind the story. Uh, sometimes he has a wonderful location then, um, where, where he says, here I want to make a film and so he starts to talk and he, he took talks to a lot of people and mm. um, and he uh, he also is uh, tries to feel the reactions how this works and how how what whatever he wants to tell how the people re react to it and how it how how it comes into a resonance of feelings and and this is i think how he collects also what is good and what is not good mm. and the actual script he usually uh, writes in a very short time period, sometimes in a week or, or so, mm. because because he is um, yeah like Mozart. Then when he said, "Yeah, I composed already. I have only to write it down." So. Now you went to university in Vienna, and I think some of your 
teachers were great talents like Vittorio Storaro, uh, Vilmos Schickmond, even Michael Snow, I think, lectured there. What did you learn from, from these masters? Yeah, they actually were not in, a, in our school where I studied, but it was similar like here, a kind of talent uh, workshop. In, uh, it was in Italy, in L'Aquila. Oh, oh, and uh, I've met them several times, so it was always in the holidays, and this campus was also for a few weeks, and so we, we had the chance to, mm. to work with those people and to talk with them. And um, the great thing was for me always because for, uh, they, they were like gods, you know. It was not like today you, just, uh, you can Google everybody, you see everybody's private life on Facebook, whatever. So, but in that time it was, uh, you saw just the big, big films. There was not even something written in any newspaper about somebody. So, so when I personally met these, my gods, this was great to see that they were simple human beings with their also mistakes and um, also what they sometimes tried to teach, for example, Vittorio Storaro about color. It was sometimes I could not understand that he thinks so in such a simple way. But then I figured out that the simple way is the only right way because all the complicated stuff is only a blah, blah talking and empty talking and the essential things are simple. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the first, uh, well, one of the most impressive films that you've done with Werner is uh, Cave of Forgotten Dreams and that's the first clip we, we can show. Uh, obviously you had to go into this cave, the Chauvet Cave in southern France. Before we see the clip, could you tell us how did you, how did you go about lighting that cave, let alone getting down into it. How did, how did you conceive lighting? Do you use small portable lights or how, how did that uh, work? Actually, um, I'm not sure which clip we are now uh, seeing, but if it's down, the, the, when when it's the first entrance of the, yeah. into the cave, um, it was a kind of funny story, maybe interesting also for students to see how, uh, how simple and how also with mistakes, uh, I, I'm always uh, facing um, to d uh, I have to deal with and how, and how I have to, to solve technical problems which we had a lot at the beginning of the shoot because originally it was not um, meant to be shot in 3D so we, uh, we were actually technically not that prepared for that and, and also the technology outside um, like when I tried to Google something, everybody promised to have uh, ready-made uh, rigs and uh, ready-made tools for doing 3D, also on a small, uh, small scale, not not like for big, uh, big uh, feature films. But when I when I really uh, tried to contact them and to 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 get help from them, technical support, then. Then, then I figured out that everything what you read in the internet is 90% fake and it's only like uh, what will be one day, whatever. And, um, and so we, we were left and uh, wet and dry, or how you call it, uh, without any support by the technicians because the German technicians especially, they are so honest. And they said, uh, yeah, we have the tools, but we cannot give it to you because we don't can we can't uh, warranty you that it's hundred percent working. Mm -hmm. And I say, come on, guys, I am here alone. But I, I have to do something. You have to give me even tools which are not hundred percent working. Mm -hmm. But the Germans they did not do it. So we had somehow to solve it. And um, so especially this first entrance to the cave um, was done by very simple 3D rig. I will show you the images then. It were just two GoPro cameras and I put them together with, by tape, by gaffer tape. And to get the lenses closer, I turned one camera upside down. Oh, and okay. um, which I figured out it was very painful that the rolling shutter of the, of the GoPro camera and they were also not synchronized. This would not be so bad. But the rolling shutter, created when, whenever the camera was panning, it, the world was distorting, and especially in 3D when you, uh, I mean in stereoscopic view, 3D is not the right expression. But when you, 
uh, when you see stereoscopic, then, then it was really weird how the world distorted. And so we had to, to deal with these problems later and to solve them. And I think it, it was okay how, how this went. At the end. Okay, can we have the first clip, please? Yeah. So how many times did you have to do that? Um, it was only once and the choice was, uh, there was no choice because we, the, the cameras which we wanted to use, the SI2 case, were not, still not working. Um, actually the cameras, yes, but the recording system with two streams small enough to bring into the cave. And we had a very, very tight time uh, frame where we had to uh, to do all this. We had, we had only three or four days and every day two or three hours, something mm. like that. So we went into the, into the cave and the only chance was to use what we had and the, I had only these two GoPro cameras, so I taped them together and, uh, and filmed our entrance. I never knew, knew that this will be actually the 20, 20 minutes, uh, first 20 minutes of mm. the final film, which was the most um, crossing, most money-making non-feature film in America mm -hmm. two years ago. Mm -hmm. So otherwise I would not have done it and I would be ashamed, but <laughs> so this is how things go. And can mm -hmm. we talk about 3D a bit? Because uh, so many films are made in quotes in 3D, but really only a handful of directors, uh, Vim Vendors uh, on this side of the ocean, Peter Jackson in New Zealand, and uh, especially James Cameron, have used it really well. Um, do you think it will have a lasting place, or do you think, as in the 50s, uh, it will die away and it will... Yeah, I think that it's, uh, it is always a 30 years period the 50s, then the 70s or 80s, and, 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 and a few years ago, that it's a real revival of 3D. Um, in this case, which we did not see uh, because it was just the beginning of the film, it made really sense to use 3D because all the paintings are part of the, 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 the relief structure of the walls and which you never see when you see just a flat photo. Mm. And this was also why the, why the decision was very shortly before we shot, because Werner was the only one who had the chance to see it. And he was also filming with a small little camera, and when he brought it to Los Angeles to the producers, then they said, what is that? We mm -hmm. can't see anything. And then he said, okay, then let's go for 3D, then you will get everything out which is in these artworks. Yeah. Uh, now, I believe you've brought along some images, and I think upstairs they've managed to get them to a state where they can show them. So, could we have the images? Uh, do you want to... Ah, no, how, this how is, these are oh, images. They're, they're. I just wanted to go through the yeah. um, improvised... Oh, I see it here, sorry. Uh, the improvisation, how we worked, it was really homemade equipment. This was a computer which had to be torn apart because it, it got too hot with the two streams to, to render all the uh, things in real time. This is a, we tried the Steadicam with a side-by-side -side, uh, configuration. Uh, Steadicam was a way too big, it was no way to bring it into the cave. So we used, this was <laughs> the <laughs> configuration of our first uh, uh, conquering the, the cave. This was the second uh, configuration with follow focus and also with um, uh, yeah with a side by side configuration with SI2K cameras, and here we see a belt uh, made out of uh, gaffer tape. One belt because when you do the focus, so the, all bo the both lenses had to turn the same the same amount and also the the the, the stop because I was always operating the stop with one hand and the focus with the, uh, with one finger and the focus with the other finger. And so this was the handheld uh, configuration of the SI2K camera with 60 millimeter sensor, uh, 60 millimeter size sensor, so we used also 60 millimeter lenses. 
this is uh, I had a monitor on on the belly, uh, and I could see the images and uh, and operated by hand. And sometimes I had a, uh, the gyro, yeah. which was for for very smooth moments. I could I could stabilize a little bit the 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 rolling of the of the two cameras, which is very unpleasant in 3D. Then this was, uh, I tried to construct a, three, uh, a mirror rig with a, just with a glass. Uh, with, it, was a, it was a coated glass, but not a very special one, uh, because we needed to get uh, a be better, a smaller I.O. What's the name? I.O.D. Interocular distance is the, the distance of the two lenses. This you can achieve only with the mirror. Uh, otherwise, you are physically uh, limited by the size of the cameras. Um, yeah, this is what we did the rest of the day, trying to construct something. Uh, as I said, we, there was no possibility to get something finished, which was pro which all the market promised. Now you can buy it very easily. Yeah, here you see the the, the two lenses, which are. Uh, through the mirror, how how they how they um, cut cut into each other. This was um, some kind I wanted to try um, a horizontal rig. Normally, you have uh, the one camera from the bottom and one camera frontally, and I tried one uh, from the side. Uh, because um, to to be able to uh, from the top was the one camera uh, to to get into the cave because it was no space on on the top and we were not allowed to scratch and to destroy the cave, so I I, I, I tried to bring the camera from the side, but uh, it was also not precise enough and also too big. So I, we decided to to do it side by side and then uh, virtually uh, bring the the cameras closer together. In the in the computer post production, and this was the camera after uh, because we went there later once more there was a two two weeks break, and so this was kind of the finished sophisticated camera with the recorder on the back, and with very two cheap uh, uh, surveillance camera lenses, but they were much sharper than the expensive ones. And they were also uh, much lighter, mechanically not that good, but we had not to use them for uh, for long, so it was good enough. But for the optical reason, they were much better. 400 or 300 euro lens, and this was a viewfinder I used um, in bright sun. Uh, it was of course not stereo, but only one eye. But the advantage was that uh, I could watch with the other eye, which was uh, which was free uh, in the real world, and I had the image in the in the other eye. And this was uh, this was our first screening <laughs> with an eclipse. <laughs> our first daily screening, and this is actually a very nice tool. Uh, it is a 5.1. Um, Dolby surround uh, recorder, two hundred dollar or hundred dollar, <laughs> you can buy it. It's a great, great stuff, and did uh, did lot of the soundtrack, which is in the original soundtrack, uh, is done by this tool. Um, here, here is the crew photo, uh, sound guy, cameraman. <laughs> this is the light panels we used. Um, maybe interesting thing is to because I was some as I asked how I did the, all the moving lights because there were not so many people. Actually, I had one light on my head, one light I, I had here uh, around the neck, and one one light I had as as a wristwatch. So whenever whenever I was walking with a camera, so I was lighting like this and with the head <laughs> and also with the breast. <laughs> And so, so I could really, really spread and move the light uh, to, 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 to bring them alive. And the rest of the crew, like Werner or everybody else, 
they were, um, they, I, I, I put them somewhere in the background because when the cave was very deep, so we need also some light in the depth too, to get uh, oh. some depth there. Yeah. Now, your work for Werner has taken you to many different places around this world, and when you shot Bad Lieutenant, I think it was very soon after Hurricane Katrina in, mm -hmm. in New Orleans, um, were you involved with a film like that, a feature film? Were you involved in looking for locations? Yes, uh, yes, uh, uh, but in a very strange way. Um, I worked with uh, art, uh, art director, with a production designer, um, very close, and and also with Werner, uh, of course. We did, uh, we did in this case because this is a bigger production, so. We had to talk to them. We had to to uh, to have some ideas and to share with them. And but what 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 he did is that he realized that Werner likes reality a lot. He he is not very comfortable with creating fake stuff. And so so he actually created for him a real world. Even he was the one who brought the cars which were burned down and which made uh, because it was already. It was not right after Katrina, so we had to recreate a little bit of the disaster as well. Mm -hmm. And so we did it before we came with Werner there, and so uh, otherwise he, he would not have liked it because it would be fake. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the clip we're going to see, uh, you go in after Nicolas Cage and you follow him. He's a cop and he's looking for evidence. And, so, and you go from one tiny room to another uh, was that built specially, that set, or was it a real? Uh, yes, a real this uh, this was a real real set, and this was uh, uh, these were two buildings which were side by side, and the idea was that there is somebody who who has to be uh, captured by the policeman, and and uh, his idea was to go through one building, beside of this building where he was hiding and uh, surprising him from the back. And the question was, and this is also the theme of our uh, meeting here, that the space, how you, how you yeah. tell the space, and one of the most important things to, to, to tell space and, and world in, in, in the screen is that you keep the consistency of the reality, that you, don't, you cannot tell these things by cutting from one image to the other. You have to keep it somehow in one go. Mm -hmm. And so this was the idea, and it is almost one go. There are also some edits, but, uh, but uh, yeah. And lighting-wise, it was kind of uh, interesting because usually when you light a small interior, then you try to to uh, to set up the lighting outside and to mm -hmm. to make it more more natural you usually you don't use lamps inside of the room especially when it's a day scene and but this these buildings were very uh, very narrow and also the, the the places between the buildings were so narrow so we had to use mirrors or uh, to 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 bring the light of the big lamps uh, via mirror into the room to, to level the interior and exterior because outside was stop 16 or 22 uh, sunlight and we had to bring at least uh, stop 8 into the inside without seeing the lamps and the light beams. Okay, could we have that extract please? Do you find it easier to light a big open space than it is to light an enclosed, restricted space, or is it the other way around, in fact? Yeah, I think it's, uh, um, it depends on the story and on the means you have. When you have only a few lamps and you have to light a big space, it's of course more mm. difficult. Mm. <laughs> but, um, but I think to light a small space is it's difficult because you have no space, mm -hmm. and so that usually when you when you do the light from outside, like the natural light would would be, um, 
and you have the space and you have the big lamps, like here we're 18 Ks and 25 Ks and whatever Ks, uh, thousands of amperes of electricity. But um, on many films you don't have this, so you have to use mirrors and mirror the sun inside and uh, then every light which you bring through the window br uh, creates a, a new shadow. So I think it's, it's challenging, yeah. It's interesting seeing, seeing the clips uh, as I did over again uh, that uh, Werner seems to like movement. He seems to like the camera to be on the move all the time rather than very static one shot like Ozu for example the, it, it's uh, it's very different it's very and, and in, in the next film we were going to see Rescue Dawn which is a wartime setting and you have prisoners escaping there's this clip where they escape and it's a very energetic job the cinematographer at that point isn't it it's much more energetic than if you just set up a, 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 a camera that doesn't move yeah although in, in this example is um is the space very important um, because it's, it's also the, the scene before Christian Bale um, is, uh, or the, the lead character is explaining the guys where's the kitchen, where, is the, where are the houses of the guards, right. where is the, the tent, uh, the, the fence, they prepared already a hole under the, the fence, it's not that they start to do it. And so in the audience um, should be some kind of um, geography mm. of the space, how the how the prison is is being made, and and so when when they start to escape, the audience should follow and know at which state of of this escape are we at at a certain moment. So so the orientation, the 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 space orientation on the screen is very important. Mm. Mm. It's not like in usual action movies where you cut just somebody hits his head and somebody falls down, a yeah. horse jumping somewhere, and nobody knows from where is coming what. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's essential to, to know where you are. Yeah. Well, if we're ready, could we have that next clip, please? And actually, it was mostly also by one shot, but uh, of course, it goes through the, you can start, it <laughs> goes through the editing and then uh, everything what you see then at the finished film is then what also the editor did. Okay. It's also his work. What kind of camera were you using for that? Uh, this was um, the movie cam SL, glaube ich, uh, glaub ich hat das geheißen. Mm. Movie cam super light. Mm. It's a very lightweight camera with, uh, with plastic housings and uh, very small. It was one of the lightest camera besides of the Ari LT mm. Mm. in the time which we used for super 35 millimeter. Mm. And uh, of course, for these kind of shots where I did uh, uh, long movements, I used sometimes also big magazines, which were very good because then the camera get better yeah. into balance. Yeah. But usually, you used uh, we used smaller magazines for the mm. handheld work and for one hand uh, shooting. Uh, what what we did not see because uh, so I promised a little too much. But uh, in the film, there is a scene where we, where we completely understand the geography. So, so when we see then the escape, we really know where we are. It is, it is now when somebody does not know the film, it is missing. Yeah. But this was the idea behind of it. We are talking also about ideas. Well, before we leave Werner Herzog, uh, perhaps we could talk a bit about Queen of the Desert, which is premiered just a couple of days ago. And uh, when you see that on the big screen in the Berlinale Palace, you almost feel it could be Freddie Young behind the camera, you know, Lawrence of Arabia and so on. So that was altogether a different kind of budget and a different kind of challenge for you. Multiple cameras, I guess, and a lot more to prepare, a lot more to control. Uh, yes, multiple cameras, yes, but um, it was... Um 
Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah, because it was the first time on a film, uh, it was, for me it was a pity that we used more cameras, because usually when you, when you use more cameras, then you trust into the people who are editing it and who are working on it, that they really uh, take the shots which are uh, which are needed for the story and for the for the rhythm, mm. and um, sometimes um, there are one or two scenes which which are, which I had a little uh, more precise uh, in my in my mind. Uh, then I saw it then on the final screen. Mm. So it's sometimes and Werner Herzog is is the one which is. Um, mostly fighting against more cameras because he's um, much more experienced and he says I don't want more cameras because then I give the producers the chance to make their film and I thought yeah this I did not really believe it that this can can happen but uh, sometimes it happens that the producers uh, start to be creative and so when you want to be directors who, who has all, all uh, control over the things, don't shoot things which you don't need, not for safety, no shooting for safety. Did, did you have a second unit to shoot, for example, the credit scenes in the desert and those long shots of the dunes? Was that done by, by uh, someone reporting to you? But not uh, yes, we had a second unit, but the second unit was I, my wife Sylvia, um, Werner Herzog and my assistant and uh, camel people. Okay. Sylvia was riding uh, in the dress of of, uh, of Nicole Kidman, and um, we ha we did we did lot of real real stuff in real weather and in real sandstorm and destroyed also some lenses with the sand. And so what did you? How did you react when? Nicole Kidman said, I want a scene with a bath, where I take a bath. And Werner said, all right, I'll write it into the script for you. How did you tackle that scene? Yeah, um, yeah it was a very, very, um, what says, intime, uh, inti, uh, intimate. Intimate, intimate scene. And uh, this was a very important private moment of the character. Mm. And... Um, and she said that, uh, yeah, I don't have to care to see something which will be then maybe rated. Mm. This is always the question of the producers. Don't show nipples, don't show this, because mm. then we get ratings and stuff like that. And she said, go for it, film it how you see it, and uh, I will act how I feel the character, mm. and so this is how, how it happened. It was actually not really staged. Werner, uh, Werner is a director who stages, he does not stage images or he does not stage mm. see, scenes. He always stages a situation and stages kind of reality or provokes reality. He, mm -hmm. he, he creates a real situation and, and uh, the camera is, um, is there and kind of cutting out of the reality, the, the parts which, which create the, mm. uh, yeah, the, the, what you see on the screen. Uh, a majority of your films, in a way, of looking through your vast list of credits, have been documentaries. Uh, therefore, by definition, you haven't worked much in a studio. I guess you're out and about most of the time. Have you ever worked in a formal studio setting where you have all the lights high up in the, in, uh, on the stage and, and so on? Only part of the films. Sometimes uh, we have to use a studio because the money comes from somewhere where you have to spend it. Yeah. And when the film is playing in the desert, then you have to go to a studio and shoot the interior stuff inside. Yeah. So that's my experience with studios. Okay. Or when it was a stage like in Invincible, it was a big part of the Hanussen Palace. Palace mm. uh, was a big stage which, were, which was completely built for the film. Mm. Now you've spent most of your life in Austria and you've worked with Ulrich Seidel. Uh, can you tell us how he differs from Werner Herzog? Uh, what kind of, uh, of control does he like to have over the lighting and cinematography. What's the relationship you have with him compared with Werner? 
Um, when I, fir uh, I met I met Werner through uh, Ulrich Seidel, they are good friends, and Werner liked uh, the work which I did with Ulrich Seidel, and so so this uh, this is how we came together. Um, Ulrich Seidel is a very honest um, person, um, and I would say bo both of them I would not call just filmmakers because they are much more. They are. Um, they are poets in collecting um, collecting things which happen re in real life mm. and put them together or, or provoke them and and um, recreate them uh, on the screen and um, I think the big difference is that Ulrich Seidel shoots much longer so one film takes several years. When Werner makes a film, it is done very quickly. So that's, uh, that's, and of course, the aesthetics are different. Um, I would say that Werner is, 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 one, is an artist who, who wants more the basic rough things mm -hmm. and does not go for stylized aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So whenever something happens which, which he calls aesthetics, he eliminates it from the film. Mm -hmm. He also, I think, uh, uh, he does not talk a lot about cinematography, mm -hmm. but when he writes in a book, like in his uh, Guide for the Perplexed, then the only thing when, when he writes about me is that he says, when I bring some aesthetics into his films, he immediately comes and turns the camera 180 degrees <laughs> in the other direction. So. Okay. This would be different with, with Ulrich Seidel. He would go for the direction uh, where you uh, create some aesthetic Aesthetic effects. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a clip from one of his films, uh, Tierischer Liebe, which I think the life of animals in English. And I think you've chosen this because, again, the use of space illustrating our theme uh, where you go into a kind of garage and you see this, this dog on a on a running uh, mm -hmm. machine. Um, so perhaps we can see that and then you can comment on it afterwards. Yeah. Could we see that clip, please? <laughs> really funny. Yeah, I think this is this is a main topic is uh, which which accompanied me and Ulrich in in our work that that we always try to portray the world of the of the people who who are the protagonists mm. and uh, and to see the world you have to move through the space and and make uh, yeah and show it as it is and of course it is not. Uh, uh, it is not real like it is, but but it's condensed. Mm. We are the one who told him put the dog there and uh, let him run. We arranged the people sitting there and so. Did on. you put the neon light bar above the uh, running platforms? Uh, that could light? It could be even this. I don't remember if we, uh, if we did this in this particular mm. case, but many times we did. Also, the natural lighting mm. uh, change. Uh, we did, we changed it for the for the, our purpose to mm. get. The, to get the, the reality condensed in what, 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 we, what we wanted to see. And the same kind of camera as you described earlier, the same lightweight camera? Uh, this also. was a 60 millimeter oh. Aton camera. Okay. It was also the one, the lightweight 60 millimeter. Mm. It was before I reconstructed the SR-16. Mm. No, what's the name, the, the, the one, the last one? The Super plastic, 16? Super 16 yeah. camera, yeah. And before we open it up for questions, I'd like to just ask you about television. You've done a lot of work for television. Mm -hmm. Are there any fundamental differences between, for a cinematographer, between shooting yes. for film and shooting uh, for television? Are there more constraints? I mean, no long shots. Long shots are never seen on television. So, uh. Yeah, definitely is a big difference. I mean, the main difference is for the, for the, make, for the makers who do it is that television um, is being created out of out of the brightness, mm -hmm. whereas the cinema comes out of the dark. Right. So uh, the the reason is because now the screens are big and 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 good, but usually in the television a dark screen 
meant that you would see the living room in the mi mirroring in, in front of you instead of the dark. So you had to avoid the dark, otherwise you would see the living room you are sitting in. Mm. And um, which is not the case in the cinema when, when you don't have the, the emergency exit light in lighting yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the screen. But, but the screen actually, you are in the cinema in the dark and watching into the bright world. So you can, you can really create it out of the dark. This is mm. the main thing. And of course then editing and uh, you have to survive in the, in the television by being very short. Mm. Tacked it, mm. Mm. Uh, which I really suffer because any film which is for, done for television, for every four seconds has to be a cut, and so you cannot even follow uh, if the in case there is some acting, some good acting which should be touching, you cannot follow because um, it is cut into pieces, mm. Mm. and of course you don't see also bad acting because it's also cut into pieces. So. Yeah, yeah. This is the advantage, so good, good chance for bad acting on TV. Well, we had, uh, just yesterday, we had uh, Sebastian Schipper uh, talking uh, after, uh, about Victoria and how they did that 137-minute take with just one, one cameraman. Uh, and uh, that on television will be much restricted because when we showed the clips, uh, just as you and I are watching on this small yes, monitor, yeah, yeah. I suddenly saw the difference between seeing it on a huge screen in the Berlin of the Palace and seeing it on a TV screen. Big difference. Big loss of quality, loss of uh, detail. Yeah, the focus and concentration in the cinema is much bigger. You, you are sitting there, it's not very usual that you escape when it's a little boring moment. Um, but I would say um, the, the, the so-called boring moments, which are called by the producers and, and most of the editors, is also because there is a rhythm and you have also to, to settle down a little bit to, to get into faster mm. uh, emotions. Uh, when, when everything is just like this, then no emotion at all is there. Yeah. And so the to have the guts to make also, as Werner said, uh, to Joshua's film, to, to, see, the, uh, to see the silence, to, to, to bring the silence on the screen. Mm -hmm. This is very important. And uh, maybe in, on TV it's not possible because then everybody is zapping to yeah. another channel. Yeah. So we've got time for questions and uh, uh, there are microphones on either side of the uh, hall and upstairs, so can you please signal to me when, and when we choose, anybody want the first question? Lots of hands going up. Any cinematographers here? There's, yeah, over here. Cool. Hello. Uh, you're talking about <clears throat> trying to create uh, a rhythm in film, uh, and you're talking about television, you have multiple shots, uh, multiple edits. Uh, with film, you have to take your time because of the nature of shooting on film. And you also talked about uh, a 30-year run with 3D, with uh, gimmicks. Do you think that in, say, another 30 years, digital shooting a movie for the cinema, digital will be in the minority again and film will make a comeback, and you'll start to see technique, uh, craftsmanship, again, like it was. Uh, sorry, what was the last word? Craftsmanship? What is that? Craftsmanship? Uh, craftsman, craftsmanship. Uh, craftsmanship, yeah. Uh, shooting film is, you, you have to take your time, you have to set up, you have to be, you have to do things particularly, and you don't have the edits like you have in television. Uh, do you think that film will make a comeback over digital in the cinema? Uh, that, that's a big topic. Um, I think the, um, the, 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 the good, the, the important task we have to face and you all have to face is that um, possibility work on digital to immediately seeing what you are doing. You have not to imagine it first and then somehow to create it and then even when you shot it you have to 
you don't have, like it was on film, you have to know what you've done and keep it in your mind and assemble all the vision uh, and all the film in your head while you are doing the next thing to, to make it to a world. Uh, this is not the, the case anymore. You, you, before you shoot, you see already, and there are even people who are, who are watching all their world through the iPhone or the iPad or whatever uh, smartphone and are not watching the reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was shocked because I'm also working a lot with students and we are still working on film in our film school in Munich. And uh, so we have these holy cameras and this holy film stock in the camera and I turned away and I turned back and the guy who is studying cinematography put an iPhone on the eyepiece and watched what is in the camera through the, through the iPhone. So I, I was shocked. I was like, <laughs> I think the world does not exist long anymore. Yeah. And, um, but, 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 but I think that the, the real thing is to find a way to trick yourself, which I also do if I have the tools I see immediately, to, to trick yourself to be forced to, to imagine, to imagine what you are doing. And so I think it's not a question of digital or not digital. Um, the, the, the disaster started already on film when we had the video uh, monitor which showed what uh, the viewfinder of the film camera. So this was the beginning of the ending. And um, I think we have to find uh, in, in future ways to, to, to train this, uh, how I would say, the inner eye to have this, this imagination and uh, which, uh, so to know what we are creating. By the way, I have to introduce uh, Mr. Dietrich Mattausch. He is a German famous actor who was actually one of the actors who played in a, uh, also in TV films with a long shot things. And please stand up and say hello, Dietrich. <laughs> and I, I, re I remember one, one scene, it was uh, also a one-shot scene with uh, several people in a, in a, um, in a police, under, uh, in a basement where the police is situated with all their machines and with all their uh, surveillance computers and monitors and whatever, and light blinkings and, and uh, shelves with weapons inside, and we were moving with the camera through and following the actors, and then uh, Dietrich had to, do, to, to make uh, his lines, it was like pages of dialogue and walking and meeting other people, they had also some lines at the dialogue and at the end he had to be in a position through a little shelf and watching in a certain direction so that the glasses had a reflection into the camera. And this was at the, 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 the very end of the shot. And uh, so we, everybody was like, you know, the machine, do da da da. Now Dietrich, okay, he made his lines, da da da. They made his lines. Everybody, did. now we saw this through the hole. And then now, now Dietrich, <laughs> and the flash was in the camera. So this was how precise uh, he worked, uh, or we worked also for television. But this was unusual. But going back for a second to the question, uh, the exhibition industry has invested so much money in converting theatres to digital. I can't see them going back uh, to film because the infrastructure just isn't there anymore and the studios don't want it because they've got rid of those huge transportation bills sending out cans of films all over the world. Uh, and everything is just so much easier to control on files. So I think there's a logistical problem there to, to go back to film, even though some people like Steven Spielberg, one of the last holdouts, uh, really believe in film and want to go on uh, shooting on film. Uh, yeah, I also heard from people who are working on Star Wars that they are also using film stock. Uh, and uh, the reason why they are using is not to give the producers too much possibility to change it. <laughs> so it's a, it's a real struggle for quality out there and um, the everybody question. has to find his tricks to, to sneak in. 
Another question? Yes, there. Oh, someone else over there? Conflicting signals. Okay. Thank you. Um, I work at a small film school in Denmark, the European Film College, and we just had Werner Herzog come and speak to us, and he bragged about you so much. And he said, my cinematographer, he's the strongest, he's the best. He, he is constantly training. He carries, he always operates himself. He runs up and down ladders with a camera. He goes under tables with a camera. And, uh, and the most important thing in a cinematographer, he told all the students, is to, to operate yourself and to be very strong and very physical. And I was wondering if, A, if you agree with that, and if that's, uh, if that's your impression as well, and uh, if that's true. And B, if you think it's important for cinematographers to always operate, and, and maybe C, also what you would tell young cinematographers to do in that physical practice. Thanks. So now we know that you, you, that's your dog, that's your uh, running machine that we see the Afghan hound on. <laughs> Yes, uh, that, that's a fact. I'm happy to hear that, and because Werner very rarely expresses his uh, to me that that he appreciates my work. <laughs> um, and actually, I, I heard that many times when some some people, some critics, or whoever asked something about the, the cinematography, and they of course wanted to type, talk about the aesthetics and about the look of the film or whatever. They want to talk, and then Werner's answer was, yes, the cinematographer, he is an ice hockey player. And he started uh. to talk about this, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's uh, the physical fitness is, is a very important part. But I think it is not uh, necessarily the case. I recently saw a film uh, which was uh, cinematographed or photographed by, or directed, cinematography directed by a cinematographer who was blind. And uh, this was a very touching um, uh, film to see that because, because it, it, it showed how important is, it is to have this inner eye that he could really film and move the camera even without seeing what's going on. He just knew what's going on. He was he, they described uh, him what is what is in the frame, where is the window, and he told them what what the people should do, the actors how they should move, and and he moved also the camera with what he felt, and and, uh, and this is something fundamental. This can only somebody do who has this inner eye uh, experience. And this is, I think, I would say this is much more important than, than uh, strong f foot muscles. <laughs> Do we have a question upstairs, to be fair? I'm always forgetting people upstairs. Anybody has a question there? No? Okay, downstairs there was one over there. Yes? yes. That's right, yeah. Uh, in the set always there is a, uh, there are moments, especially in, the, in, in independent films that there is a struggle between director's career resume and cinematographer career resume. There are moments that, for example, the light's going, but you need to shoot. I wonder, in relationship like yours, I assume it happens to you, when, when would you just step in and say, okay, I can't do anything? I mean, like the, the shot in the, the, we saw the opening going through the the cave was really impressive, but as you say, it's, just, it's not the perfect work. When you do it for film, when you think it's, you should stop as a cinematographer? Yeah, I think the, 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 the only question would be some ethic moments which, you, which I would say you cannot film that. But, um, but usually, uh, usually I did not encounter this situation because usually even it was some situation which I thought better not to do it uh, close to pornography or whatever because it just happened during the documentary situation. Uh, but, but then I thought, okay, we have not to decide now. Why turn off the camera? We, 
we run the camera, we roll the camera, and then we decide if we put it into the film or not. And this we did, and it was not in the film that then, at the end. But uh, usually there should not be any reason not to shoot, especially not when there's bad weather or whatever. This is the moment where we should shoot, not only with the nice weather. And also when there are difficulties, go for it. Every difficulty brings a character into, into what you are doing. Or every obstacle, go for obstacles. Don't, don't choose the clean world, don't choose the perfect world. Choose the sick world, the personality world, and the world with character, and the dirty world, the wet world, the windy world, the dusty <laughs> world. The, the world, not the cleanliness. It used to be in Hollywood, uh, uh, certainly until very recently, it was very difficult for a European cinematographer to go there and to do his own operating because of the union restrictions. Yeah. But I assume that with these lightweight cameras, it's very hard to distinguish. I mean, you, you're, either, you're either doing a cinematography or you're not. Yes, they, they changed the rules a little bit because of so many European cinematographers. And, uh, and also because they, as a, so when I shot the first films in America, I, I got a, it was called a waiver, wa or waiver, yeah. waiver from the union. Um, this was a little procedure with some lawyers and then they gave me the allowance to operate myself. But uh, sometimes you, you, you needed to hire some operator and uh, usually when you shoot with more cameras, then the operator operates one of the cameras. So nobody is then very precise if this is the camera A or camera B or so. Or you can ask them to sit on, sit on a chair in the corner and say, don't worry, we'll pay you, but I'm going to do the operating. This we actually did with parts of the team. <laughs> uh, for example, video operators and uh, sometimes stand-ins you have to hire because of the union. And they are also uh, checking it, so you cannot just write on paper that he was there. They were really coming from the union, visiting the set, and checking this. Okay. Another question? Yes, you don't know. And then, and then uh, early in your career, who inspired you and why did they inspire you? Um, yeah, I mean, the most inspiring for me was always a magic moment on the screen. And um, cinematographer like Vittorio Storaro, or we mentioned Wilma Sigmund, yeah. we mentioned uh, Sven Nyquist. Any but of the great German cinematographers? I mean, there's a tremendous tradition in, in, in the German-speaking territories of uh, Eugen Schuften, Gunther Rittau, these great cinematographers of the, the past. The, yes, they are great, but I have not met them, so mm. maybe if I would have yeah. met them, they would inspire me yeah. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lady here yeah. in the front. Is but but the, basically, um, most of them were so, some people who were looking for images which were more than real and which were not uh, just uh, just images, but this which were which were some kind of world, and yeah. So this is what I was looking for. Did you look at Lawrence of Arabia when you before you made Queen of the Desert by chance? I just I just wondered if you. Uh, not especially before, but I saw the film mm. some years ago. Yeah. I usually I don't like to watch other films, especially when they seem to be similar because uh, it closes the mind. That's also the problem of, of nowadays when people grow up with millions of films and with millions of YouTube clips and uh, whatever clips, uh, Vimeo, and uh, where, you can, where you just, you can click and you can see parts of the film, so nothing has a value. And this destroys also your own fantasy. I think it's hardly impossible, so I try not to see things which are similar. Uh, yes, there's someone in the front row down the front who wants to have a hand up for a question. No? No? Somebody's waving? Yes, okay. <laughs> so I, I have a question concerning, um, well, the, the whole art of making a film. 
basically turns out to be evaluated as a good film or a bad film. But now, seeing the critics to, for example, The Queen of the Desert, people say, well, it's a medium film, but it's great images. Would you that, consider that as a cinematographer as a successful film then, if it has great images? Um, yeah, it's good for the ego, but it's bad. <laughs> Yeah, but it's bad in a, in a bigger way because uh, I, I would say that a f that a, that the film should be in balance with everything, the music, the um, which does not mean if it's true, but it's uh, just somebody wrote it. But if it if it would be the case, then uh, then I would say the film is out of balance, and uh, the the camera work and all the. Um, production design work and uh, uh, music, especially sound design, the soundtrack, should all be uh, one whole, uh, one whole experience. It should not be one sticks out. This is this is bad, I would say. Are you ever uh, able to have? Do you ever have the luxury of working in advance with a production designer or even a sound designer? Or even a composer. Do you, do you ever ha have that chance? Yeah, I, uh, yes. Uh, whenever it is possible, I go for that. And um, especially uh, production design is one of the most important things uh, for the for the for the look. I don't like the w w word look, especially, but how the film is looking. Let's say it's with the texture and the expression of the film. And uh, and sometimes I. Um, I have the feeling of music uh, for my own, and this is good for the movements of the camera. So, but it is very hardly any possible to to have the composer on board before, or even know the music. This would be ideal to to, to know the music which is on the scene, and we could adapt it together to get the right rhythm. Mm -hmm. Usually, the music is composed uh, to the images. Mm -hmm. Another question? Um, uh, uh, there's somebody here, but I just wonder if I'm leaving out anyone at the back. There is someone in the middle, the back, please, and then we'll come back to you. So can you put your hand up? Okay. How oh, you put it down? Oh, no, it's Hi. Do Thanks. you ever storyboard your shots before in the planning stage, or how do you plan your shots? Uh, sometimes yes, but I'm very skeptical to storyboarding uh, to, to, for two reasons. First, um, sometimes on bigger projects, the storyboards are done by storyboard artists. And the storyboard artists are uh, two-dimensional image thinkers. Mm. And they are not directors, they are not visualizers. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it's a trap, because you have to do it, because of uh, planning big scenes and with visual effects and whatever. So you have to, you need these images to communicate what we need, how you put this together. But it is a trap because you lose the spontaneity and also the life of the, of the movements. Um, I don't know how, for example, uh, uh, the people did it with Avatar, but they, they showed a big freedom in movements. I'm sure this can't be storyboarded. Mm -hmm. They probably used some previsualization. Mm -hmm. Previsualization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, technology may be computer based or where, where already a moving camera was part of the previsualization. And um, but it's uh, just storyboard images, th that's a big trap. I, I don't uh, like I think it, even I do it myself as well, but it's bad. And I think storyboarding works better with studio films. I was on location with God, well, not location, with Chinichita with Godfather 3 in 1989, and Gordon Willis was, had the whole thing storyboarded, but of mm -hmm. course they were shooting on a soundstage. There was hardly any external work. Everything was set up, mm -hmm. much easier to control. Yeah. yeah. Another question? Another, there was somebody over here who has been waiting. Well, yeah, okay. Can we have a mic? Uh, <coughs> Just a um, similar question, since you've worked both with documentary and uh, lots of fiction. In terms of lighting, 
uh, any anecdote or any experience because the two have very different approaches to lighting uh, in general. Uh, have you uh, tried, I'm sure you have, uh, but have you tried doing documentary lighting for fiction scenes? Any, uh, any anecdotes on that would be interesting. Uh, anecdote I, I don't know at the moment, but I can tell you that, that my opinion to lighting is that the biggest art in lighting is uh, to work with available light. Biggest art, I say, because it's not just taking what's there, but you have to go through the process to know how you, uh, how you deal with shadows and light and uh, different colors and te textures and also materials which you light, because light is not only light, light is also uh, the material w which is hit by light. And when you study all this and then at the highest level, you, you, uh, you, you control the available light by, uh, I don't know, shutting, hiding lamps which are not used or shading by uh, fl uh, flooding light from exteriors, things like that, shaping the face by uh, directing the, 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 the characters into the position, how they look good, not like, uh, you don't see my eyes now because I'm black, but now you see it. And so when I would be an actor, I would uh, be always like this because I know that then uh, you see me, me very nicely. And so this is, this is I think, the, the, the aim which we should go for, but it's not there where we should start. And so the big mistake is that everybody starts with available light and then uh, get, got stuck. Mm -hmm. So the difference uh, for me, there is no difference. Otherwise, uh, if you need a, an artificial scene which has to be lit like with artificial light, then it's at the end also natural, but it's artificial because of the situation. I don't know if I could express myself or Dimenia. Have you, uh, have you ever shot in black and white or recently? And if so, what's the difference for you, black and white and color? Um, <clears throat> I have, I've, I've shot uh, black and white, only short films, mm. no long feature film, and uh, which is a pity because I uh, like the reduction to bright and dark mm. very much. Um, I like any reduction, but this is a, a big gift for, a, for every art or every expression on film when, when you are limited to something. A black and white is one of the beautiful, most beautiful uh, redu yeah. reductions. Yeah. Another question? No? There's someone right there. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you wait for the mic, because also yeah, it, will not appear, was, uh, it won't appear on the, was, uh, on the archive. You won't see yourself on the archive, so. Uh, okay. What, what kind of dialogue do you like to have with the director in pre-production and preparing for the films? If so, and uh, what kind of dialogue is conducive to the shooting afterwards in production? Yeah, uh, I like the, uh, the dialogue, as I said, how how Werner Herzog does it, that he tells aspects of the story, that he tells aspects of, of the characters. Um, this I like. What I not really like is when somebody says, I have, it should look like this film, or look, it should look like this, because I learned that, that people see different things on different films. So when somebody says, uh, I want a film, it should look like, I don't know, um, whatever film, and then you see this is an action movie and he's doing a love story. So uh, I don't understand what he means by that. Okay, so we have time for one more question. This uh, microphone is not working. Okay. It's not working. Maybe the, there's a switch. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so I have a similar question, but about documentaries. You mentioned you have sort of an inner eye, and I guess the directors also, Ulrich and Werner, have it. And how do you communicate about it? Like, do you have some conflicts about, like, about what should be 
in the shots, or it's more like your responsibility. Okay, thank you. Yeah, on, on, on documentary there, you rely on the trust of the director, and usually they put you in the scene and they trust that you get what it's needed. And when you have to condense it, when you have to change the situation, when you have to, uh, whatever, put somebody in frame or uh, remove some stuff which are disturbing, then of course uh, this is very quickly discussed. We say, yes, this is not good, put it there and we'll put this out and so on. Or let's move here a little faster and so on. But, but it's more, you are more governing uh, the, the happening on documentary, of course, than on feature film. On a final note, uh, Peter, how do you see the future? Do you think it's exciting with, in spite of what our friend down there says about the return to film, do you think it's exciting, the possibilities of digital, that you'll be able to do more things with a camera than you could ever do when you were just starting your career? Yes, exciting on the one hand, but it's also very difficult on the other hand because of the, all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. and, and so, as I said, the, the important thing is to find the reduction and the concentration on important things. Mm -hmm. And when you, uh, and, and yeah, and this is of course much more difficult when you find everything there and you can pick this, you can pick that, you can, you, you know, it's ran the randomness is the greatest enemy of creativity. Well, Peter, this has been a masterclass, a 90-minute masterclass. Thank you so much for spending the time to come Thank with us. Thank you Wonderful. for being here. Thank you.